This is CBC Here and Now. Education overhaul. Change is needed from math to mental health to inclusion. It's a start. We've got the biggest crowd plant in the world. A look at the Quinlan's operation in Beta Verde. I wouldn't be here without those people. So we had just finished um, soldering some electrical circuit boards. They're the best, the brightest, and they're here. A wonderful Wednesday shaping up right across the province. We're going to add in some showers for late week into the weekend. The details are coming up. Good evening. Our top story tonight. Sweeping changes are recommended to the province's education system. Yes, the Premier's Task Force on Improving Educational Outcomes was released today in Deer Lake. Here now is Colleen Connors was at the announcement and joins us live. Colleen, give us the overview. Well, Debbie, it is all about this right here. The final report, 173 pages of the Premier's Task Force on Improving Educational Outcomes. Now, this is called Now is the Time, which is the title they've put on this final report, which would make you think that it would all be implemented immediately. There are 82 recommendations in this long uh, document here. Major concerns with the education system. The biggest one, of course, is inclusion, and they're saying that inclusion education is not working. There is a persistent underachievement in math and reading. Mental health and wellness are not being addressed properly in the classroom. And education for teachers is another major issue. So there's a lot here and there's a lot of homework needed to overcome these big changes. No one said implementing those, those recommendations would be easy. What we do know is that they're required. And this task force addresses that. If we are truly concerned and we want this task force to reflect what we see the future of the education system will be. That requires the discipline for the leaders that we put in place to carry out those recommendations. It was never said it would be easy, but we know it's required. Now the Premier has, in the province, has hired Eldred Barnes. Now he is a school system administrator and he's going to make sure that all of these things suggested in this book are implemented in the classroom. But the question now is when will all of that happen? Well students and teachers and parents are not going to see any changes in the school system until September 2018. There is an urgency, no doubt, but the sky is not going to fall in before we get changes made. I think the important thing here is that we committed to this task force. It has done its work. There's no doubt there's sort of, uh, you know, things in there that don't sit well with me and don't sit well with, with others, uh, but the onus is on us now to act. Now, the big question now is how much is the government going to put forward to help implement these changes? How much money is going to be spent? Well, it wasn't indicated exactly how much today, but there will be money allocated to help these 82 recommendations be implemented in the classroom. Live in Cornerbrook, I'm Colleen Connors for Here and Now. Okay, so that's the big picture. Now let's take a closer look at some of the issues and the recommendations. Now this past winter, CBC presented many of these concerns during our special series Inside the Classroom. We heard directly from teachers that major changes were needed, including an overhaul of special education. Here now is Ryan Cook worked on that series and he joins us now live. So Ryan, take us through some of the details of these 82 recommendations. Well, the placement of inclusive education at the front of this report is no coincidence. The report says keeping all children in the classroom is simply not working. Kids struggle due to a lack of one-on-one -on -one learning, curriculum, be curriculum becomes watered down, and in fact, during 10 public consultations across the province, not one person supported the inclusion model. They are recommending to replace the inclusion model, saying it has not benefited students or teachers. The task force wants to see children's needs identified earlier, even before they start school. They also want a new type of student assistant with a role in classroom instruction. And those are just some of the recommendations regarding inclusion. Then there's curriculum changes like math and reading, two areas where the province lags behind the national average. Teachers said math was overcomplicated with several methods used for the same problems. Uh, the, the report gives teachers the freedom to choose now which method they want to teach with. It also calls for one hour of math per day for students in K-9. On reading, the report says earlier intervention for poor readers could turn around the province's liter literacy scores. It also says our Indigenous education can use a boost. 
both in teaching non-Indigenous students about other cultures and in helping Indigenous students displaced from their homes. Perhaps the most shocking point, however, was on dropout rates. These students end up availing of government services. You can see that number there. That's $20 million of taxpayer dollars on average each year. And the report says that that might be a conservative number. To implement this report will take cooperation from numerous government departments. It'll take staff, it'll take money, it'll take coordination. And they say it has to happen now. Government hopes to start implementing changes in 2018. Debbie? Thanks very much. That's our Ryan Cook live in our studio this evening. So what do those in the classroom make of today's announcement? The president of the Teachers uh, Association teachers says his group uh, needs a more thorough look at the nearly 173 page report. But on the surface, he's glad the committee saw eye to eye with teachers when it comes to inclusive education. It reaffirms uh, and bolsters what we've heard from our own members uh, in the field, uh, from teachers in the classroom. It is not surprising because other provinces and other teacher organizations are getting the very same thing from their members. So to see it recognize that the inclusive education system, uh, system is not working the way teachers want it to be uh, is not surprising. Well, in other news tonight, some of the country's leading experts in public safety and mental health are meeting in St. John's this week. It's the official launch of the Canadian Institute for Public Safety Research and Treatment, an organization dedicated to researching mental health issues and helping workers deal with them. Here and now is Megan McCabe has more. The jobs are not easy and it's often traumatic. Fatal car crashes, fires, murders, you name it. First responders, police, firefighters, paramedics, corrections officers, and more, they all see what people are not supposed to see. Police officers, we start our career and we go about our work uh, every day, and we're out helping people, and we don't sometimes focus on the fact that there are there any impacts in this process for us, and it's something you come to the realization later on in life. For the first time ever, a nationwide organization is focusing on learning more about the mental stresses of these jobs. The Canadian Institute for Public Safety Research and Treatment, or CIPSERT, officially launched today with a three-day summit in St. John's. The goal is to increase the education, reduce stigma, uh, build the resilience of responders so that we reduce the, the number that are impacted by this and certainly bring them earlier stage treatment. The group is launching a new web tool for first responders. They can screen themselves for PTSD, anxiety, depression, and then take those results to a professional for help. Each individual responder's issues are different, but they all add up to a national issue. Because these different public safety organizations and the personnel that they serve are facing, in many cases, very similar challenges with respect to their mental health and their mental health concerns. Because they're facing similar challenges, it makes sense that they should work together. Organizers are hoping to finish this summit with some concrete ideas for helping first responders as quickly as possible. Megan McCabe, CBC News, St. John's. Reginald Howard White has admitted to being responsible for the death of one man and injuring another while driving drunk. The charges involve a vehicle rollover in Millertown two years ago. A passenger was thrown from White's vehicle when it crashed. He was pronounced dead at the scene. The other passenger suffered serious injuries. White, who's from Buckins Junction, pleaded guilty to impaired driving causing death and impaired driving causing bodily harm. He will be sentenced on Friday. Friday. Well, the North American Indigenous Games wrapped up on the weekend, and you can bet there are a lot of excited young people from this province returning home with their hardware. Yes, we certainly made our presence known at the Games in Toronto. The final tally is now in, and it shows athletes from Newfoundland and Labrador took home more than 30 medals. 5,000 Indigenous athletes between the ages of 13 and 19 participated in the Games, with about 150 of them from this province in Newfoundland and Labrador made it to the top 10 coming in eighth place overall. Athletes from here claimed three gold, six silver and 25 bronze for a total of 34 medals. And those gold medals were won by athletes in track and field and swimming. Dana Chubbs collected top honors for her performance in javelin. Holly Brochu won 
gold in the high jump and Ryan Parsons won gold in the 400 meter freestyle swimming competition. First place honors went to British Columbia for winning 179 medals. Nice and congratulations to all of the athletes and speaking of athletics if you're hoping to get out for a run tomorrow well, the forecast looks dynamite. We're going to talk all about that right after the break. Some future scientists are likely among the crowd of young people at Memorial University this week. We'll tell you all about them in about three minutes. All right, Ryan's here to talk about the weather, but before we get to that, uh, we have some really beautiful drone video to show you. It was uh, shot by a passenger on the Canada C3 icebreaker that's now exploring the shorelines uh, all over the province. And Gary, I think we have that uh, video there. It is just gorgeous. Fogo Island right there. It was posted, uh, this video, by Gary Tut or Toot. He's on board the icebreaker, which is circumnavigating Canada as part of the Canada 150 celebrations. Wow. Oh, so envious. Yeah, now uh, the 150-day sailing journey from Toronto to Victoria via the Northwest Passage. So it's a long journey, but obviously a beautiful one. <laughs> 
They're aboard, uh, as we said, a former Canadian Coast Guard ship that's now being used for research. Yes, and uh, Gary wrote uh, when he posted oh, this look video. At that. Just stunning. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Gary posted that this is uh, just a small montage of places that they've visited in the past 10 days. And I think I saw online that the ship is now in the, the Hebron area. Okay, in Labrador. Uh, in Labrador. So. Labrador, wow. Hopefully they will post more beautiful video like oh, this. The beaches and, oh, just gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that, oh man, uh, this is just a marvelous, marvelous uh, video there and uh, thanks to uh, Gary for passing that along so we can pass it along and share it with you. Highs today, if you were uh, in the east, obviously a little on the cool side, just 15 degrees, the high at uh, YYT and that was mainly thanks to that onshore flow and those showers that have been passing over the southeast. Did get to 22 from places like uh, Deer Lake to Corner Brook, again in the low 20s through central parts of Newfoundland as well. 21 in Happy Valley Goose Bay and yes, Labrador City uh, today topping out around 22 degrees as well. And in terms of where we are right now, still at 22 in Labrador City, it's just 11 in St. John's. So uh, dare I say feels a little like fall out there uh, for this evening. No question about that as we have those uh, uh, rains that are moving in f just off to uh, the southeast is the center of this system, but close enough that it has been bringing those showers. In Labrador, it's been a pretty fine day. A couple of spits here, no question, uh, into the southeast parts of Labrador, but most of the action today has indeed been over the island. And the visible satellite from our GO-16 high-resolution satellite shows a sunshine breaking in over western parts of Newfoundland for this afternoon. In the east, it's been those showers, but uh, those are starting to move offshore, and we are seeing some breaks in the cloud already off to the south. And as we roll through the overnight with the future tracker, you can see things clear out quite nicely by even by late evening. And it's a fine start to Wednesday. Bit of cloud cover, I think, lingering in the east early on, 6, 7 a.m. Uh, may see some, some cloud cover in the sky, but certainly the sun in the mix already at the start of the day. And uh, yeah, really across the big land, Labrador City to Happy Valley Goose Bay. Everyone's starting dry tomorrow morning. It's a very nice start, 8 to 12 degrees generally for pretty much everybody across the province. Now, as we work throughout the day tomorrow, note the wind direction here with the wind contours, and you can see those arrows coming from the north and northeast. That's going to be obviously key to the forecast tomorrow in terms of temperatures, especially from St. John's up that northeast coast. Uh, the island itself stays quite pleasant in terms of lots of sunshine, uh, but certainly some cloud cover building up into Labrador and a weak disturbance may spark up a shower from Churchill Falls to Happy Valley Goose Bay and across to Cartwright and even possibly as far south as Mary's Harbor. So tomorrow morning, sun and cloud, nine degrees. We'll only get up to about 18, I think, St. John's proper. You work your way inland towards Mount Pearl, and I think we're going to be talking closer to 20 degrees. And with that east-northeast wind, places like CBS likely in the 22 degree range, again shielded from that onshore wind. Uh, 16, mainly clear skies uh, for tomorrow evening again. Directly in those onshore winds, if you have a lighthouse picnic tomorrow in Fairyland, yeah, just 16 degrees in those onshore winds directly, but as warm as 24 towards the south coast tomorrow. Grand Falls, Windsor as well, 24 degrees. 20 to 22 along parts of the west coast as winds will be fairly light there, so a bit of a sea breeze set up. And again, there are those shower possibilities sparking up from Churchill Falls to Happy Valley Goose Bay to Mary's Harbor and Cartwright. Not lots of sun to the north and west and a pretty nice day in the Straits. Another nice one for Thursday on the island. Uh, certainly temperature is really warming up. We'll talk about that. And then we're going to be bringing in our next weather maker for Friday into the weekend, of course. All those details in just a few minutes. Debbie? Thanks, Ryan. Well, some of the country's best and brightest young minds are spending the month at Memorial University. The SHAD program selects the top science students from all over Canada to attend an intensive 27 day program at 13 different universities. Here now is Jeremy Eaton stop by Memorial to learn a little bit more about the program. The front over. The front one. Yeah. Okay. Hey. 
Chat is a program for curious high school students. So in grades 10, 11, and 12, they can spend the month of July at one of 13 university campuses across the country. So they go away from home, and over the course of that month, they're exposed to lectures, workshops, field trips, and they're given a real-world problem to solve. So it's really exposing them to experimenting, to prototyping, to being an entrepreneur, uh, and it's a chance to, to be with other like-minded students. I think for many of the students, that's what they say is the best part about the program, is they're together with 56 or 57 other students uh, like them right across the country. Soldering some electrical circuit boards, um, so you can see at the back here, we did. There's a lot of fun, one thing. We are involved with really smart people. Uh, so every year is going to be a new batch. Uh, it's very exciting because you learn a lot from the students, right? They are, I mean, they are like up to speed on all the latest trends and everything. And as you get older, I guess you, you, you're trying to keep up with them, you know? When you're in shared, you almost operate in shared time. Okay. Although it's only a 27-day program, but after the first two days, they interact so well because they're all so like-minded that it seems like they have known each other forever. So, and we have that, all of us have that feeling. Right? Went to a relatively small school here, so it was really great to go and meet other students that were really interested in STEM and business. It was my first time kind of living in residence and meeting those students, and it really inspired me to kind of uh, dream big and go to a big university and sort of broaden my horizons, so it was a great program. For the most part, I just wanted to come back and, and go back into a learning style um, where you're so immersed in so many different subjects and actually have the hands-on applications on so many different things. It's really interesting to come back and be immersed in the program again. We've had a lot of really, really great lectures from some really interesting people and I think that's been the highlight for me. Well, I think it's just been really cool to get exposed to Newfoundland culture as I've never been here before and just meeting lots of new and talented people, uh, like-minded people who are driven and you know want to learn. I really like chemistry as a science but I'm actually considering a career in history and Chad has helped me to to realize that I can do that, I can follow my interests. Yes. Thanks to the generosity of HMDC, we have a real special program here in Newfoundland. That HMDC is in, a, in the middle of a five-year agreement with us where every year they send 50 students to SHAD at no cost to the students. So right now there are 50 uh, high school students from Newfoundland spread out across the country uh, at the other 12 SHAD campuses and uh, HMDC is paying the full cost for those students to attend opportunity for those young people. Now if you want to see firsthand what these bright minds are up to, there is an open house this Thursday from 1 to 4 in the Engineering Building at Munn. Well, the Premier has announced plans for big changes for the education system, especially around inclusion. We'll have reaction from one of the organizations pushing for change in about three minutes.
new education report released today is getting good reviews from the province's Autism Society. As you heard earlier, the report recommends an overhaul in the approach to inclusive education and admits that inclusion in the classroom has failed. I sat down with the Autism Society's executive director, Scott Crocker. This report begins by saying flat out that inclusion as it's currently being practiced is not working. What do you make of that? Well, I, I agree, absolutely, and, and that's been one of my messages for many years. Uh, it's not working. It's broken, and it's not going to work until some significant changes are made. And the biggest changes are extra supports, additional supports, number one, for in the classroom, but then secondly, having the ability and being able to remove children on occasion for additional teaching and support and so on when it's needed in an alternate setting. We believe there should be access to both and the report comes out in favor of that sort of thing as well. Um, inclusion is the issue. It, it, it pervades everything in the classroom. So it, if inclusion isn't working, what does the alternative look like? Well for people with autism it means an awful lot of them aren't in school. Uh, the parents may have given up in frustration and pulled them out and they're doing homeschooling. The parents may have had no choice and the kids have just been sent home and they're at home. And there's no schooling, no education being provided by uh, the school or the school district or the department. It doesn't matter where you lay the blame, it's just not happening. What will this do for those children? Well, this would get those, those children in. The other, the other thing I was going to mention was that there are many kids who are out on partial days. They're, because of inclusion, they're in the classroom with many other students and many other exceptionalities and needs. Because they can't cope and there's no resources to deal with it when they can't cope, they're sent home. So they're only allowed in for an hour or an hour and a half a day. That's not education. That's not a, that's not a living example of a child's right to learn and grow. So that's not inclusion. And one of the recommendations is that there be no children out of school, that it's mandatory that there be no partial days, that they be in school. And the other part of that, of course, is then holding people accountable to make sure that that happens. And I'm delighted that this report seems to be going in some new directions and suggesting some things that if we are able to implement them as we go forward, I think will absolutely be positive. Can you talk about some of those new directions? What do you see in here that makes you uh, especially delighted? Well, one of the things they talk about is the fact that speech language pathologists and occupational therapists and guidance counselors and classroom teachers and so on cannot keep up with the growing need of exceptionalities that are appearing in classrooms. I mean, we know autism rates are, are just increasing all the time. And so there's a recommendation about increasing numbers. And we know we need more guidance counselors. We need more instructional resource teachers. One thing I particularly like is the notion of making mandatory the connection between early interventions for people with autism now I'm talking about, who've been diagnosed and are receiving interventions, making a mandatory connection between that and kindergarten or primary school. Right now, it's not really there at all. Uh, let's get the transitioning into school for all children with exceptionalities. If all of these recommendations do come into effect, can you describe how things would change for a typical child, uh, if you can say that, mm -hmm. about a child with autism, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> for a student with autism in a school? How, how would things change for them and for all of the other students? Uh, that's a very good point because the implementation of the recommendations will benefit all students. We argue strongly, for instance, that occupational therapies, therapists need to be in classrooms providing services and they benefit all students in classrooms. It's not just children with autism or, or some other developmental delay. Here would be my ideal and what I would hope for uh, in the case of a child with autism. An early diagnosis, evidence-based intervention programs that we know research says has positive results and then good preparation for school. And then before actually entering school, some transition process that 
that removes some of the anxiety, takes down some of the barriers, and makes it a much, much more welcoming process. And then when the child gets in the classroom, if the child is capable of spending the full day in the classroom and coping and learning and doing well and growing and being happy, that's wonderful. If the child needs some additional support to stay in the classroom, well, that's where the instructional resource teachers, the student assistants, or the new recommendation that's made, instructional assistants may come in. But the other part of it is that sometimes that child with autism may perhaps for one period a day, two periods a day, may need to be removed from that classroom and go into a small group setting in an alternate area. That should be happening too. All that we've ever said and all that we've ever argued is that education needs to be needs-based. And you, you, you cannot service any child with special needs if you put the dollar figure there first. It just doesn't work that way. It doesn't happen. Scott Crocker, thank you very much. And thank you. These fabulous images show off the beautiful community of Beta Bird. In about three minutes, we'll show you more and tell you why the community is part of the Canada 150 project. Something a little different for you now. As Canada marks 150 years since Confederation, CBC has been running Canada 2017, a year-long project to mark Canada's sesquicentennial. They've been bringing us stories from coast to coast to coast. Now, one of those stories is from Bay de Verde, where the Quinlan Brothers' brand new crab plant was up and running just one year after fire destroyed their old plant. Quebec television host and food writer Ricardo was in Bay de Verde. I'm here in Bay de Verde, one of the many fishing villages on the coast of Newfoundland and Labrador. But this one is different. It's home to the biggest export of snow crab in the world. Wayne Quinlan and his son Robin are the second and third generation of a whole family dedicated to process the best quality snow crab in Canada. They export around 5,000 tons of it every year. People are fishing here for a very long time, eh? Bedford was settled in the late 1600s. 
is one of the most picturesque towns in Newfoundland. It's very unique with the landscape. It's a harsh environment, as you can see, living on the headlands, but it brings a lot of beauty. In the springtime, the icebergs come from the north. It's uh, prime fishing grounds, good location for a fish processing facility. The Quinlan business is very important in the area here. Eh? It's a lot of jobs for everyone. You got the biggest uh, crab plant in the world. In the world? Approximately now, there's a little over 500 people today wow. working on both shifts. There's some good people with us. It is indeed uh, an extended family. Every one of them gave 150%. I wouldn't be here without those people. How come this Newfoundland crab is the best? What makes it so different from the rest of it? Well, one of the reasons that we have 60% uh, of our vessels land right here to the wharf. Okay. okay, there's no trucking, there's no, the crab practically crawl in the plant. The fact with the Newfoundland snow crab fishery, it's a wild harvest fishery. All the crab that come off the bottom, the conditions they come by, it's a completely natural occurring fishery. What makes the product as good as what it is, is the fact that it is wild harvest. How much crab are we harvesting a year? This year, we hope to do approximately 15 million pounds. Wow. Our crab is sold in Japan. We have technicians here from companies that we've been dealing with for the last 20 years. U.S. companies we've been dealing with for 45 years. So the Quinlan brand has become quite strong in the market. Our customers come back year after year to uh, ensure that they have their containers filled. Well, thanks a lot for all that pride and this great crab that we eat around the world. I hope Thank you, you enjoyed it. In 2016, Canada exported $6.6 .6 billion worth of seafood to more than 136 countries. Snow crab accounted for $800 million of those international sales. We are without a doubt the biggest snow crab producer in the world. And that's why we are the best. Absolutely gorgeous pictures. Oh, and yeah. Of course, Beta Bird is gorgeous anyway, but it's so lovely to get the uh, view from above. Mm -hmm. And so amazing, you know, that there was all, so much devastation from the fire in April of 2016. You saw it firsthand. Oh, yeah. It, it was devastation. It was hard to look at it, but uh, in less, well, in about a year, they had rebuilt. So pretty good. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, turning now to uh, national news, we've had a lot of well, we've heard actually a lot of talk around ticks and Lyme disease, but public health officials are also keeping an eye out for another blood sucker. It's called the Lone Star Tick. And while it's not officially in Canada, a few have been found. As health reporter Christine Birak explains, it carries Lyme disease and can trigger a bizarre allergy. Sure, people probably wouldn't even believe it. Les Waters says okay. while it sounds crazy, after a lifetime oh, okay. of backyard barbecues and game hunting, he now has a dangerous allergy to most meat. It's like full out scary. It's like yeah, you're right. your throat swells up, you can't breathe, your blood pressure basically drops off till you black out and you have to hit it with an EpiPen. Researchers say Waters was likely bitten by the Lone Star Tick, distinguishable by a tiny white dot on its back. This is fairly unusual, and it's one of just one of those quirky aspects of nature. So how in the world does a tick bite make someone allergic to red meat? Researchers say while it's not entirely clear, it helps to remember that any allergic reaction is your immune system trying to fight off something that's not really dangerous. One of the proteins in its saliva looks to our body like something that's, on the, that's present in red meat. So you develop antibodies to that tick saliva. Then, depending on your sensitivity, whenever that protein shows up again, those antibodies attack. Only this reaction usually happens several hours later, unlike peanut and other food allergies that happen immediately. But I don't want people to overreact because this is probably, at this point, a problem in the southeast and southeast United States. It isn't in Canada very, very often at this point. Experts say ticks are slowly moving north due to climate change. They can also carry Lyme disease. I fish, I hunt, I'm like in the woods a lot. Now I'm, every time I've got second thoughts about it. 
Experts say the best way to avoid tick-related diseases, cover up, use bug spray with DEET, and remember, check your skin when you get back inside. Christine Birak, CBC News, near Harcourt, Ontario. To Britain now, where a mother was back in court today just a day after giving up a legal battle to save her terminally ill baby. Connie Yates and her partner Chris Gard want an order allowing them to take their infant Charlie home to die. The 11 months old has a rare genetic disorder that's left him with irreversible brain damage and unable to breathe on his own. Charlie's parents had hoped an experimental treatment in the U.S. could save Charlie, but a doctor there says it's too late to try. Charlie now has only days to live. The hospital caring for him argues it is the best place for him to die without pain. A judge will announce his decision tomorrow. Back to the U.S. now. Uh, the U.S. president is drawing a lot of criticism for a speech he gave last night to the National Scout Jamboree. Donald Trump told the thousands of scouts he was not going to talk politics, but the critics say the speech had all the marks of a campaign rally. By the way, just a question. Did President Obama ever come to a jamboree? Trump referred to the health care vote in the Senate today and jokingly said he'd fire his health secretary if the measures he wants fails to pass. He implied politicians have turned Washington into a cesspool or sewer, and he said a vote for him in the election last year was a vote to make America great again. The U.S. Senate voted this afternoon to move ahead on health care legislation aimed at dismantling the Obama health law. The weather update is brought to you by Bell Tone Hearing Service St. John's, helping the world hear better. Well, we sure have had a. a what's that? <laughs> I, know, I was just going to say, and Ryan, you're not here to talk about weather. No, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead. We've had a great run. Oh, no, you go ahead. Well, yeah. <laughs> oh, no, you. <laughs> uh, we have had a great run of sunny weather and uh, great for getting out on the water. And guess what? More whale video, which uh, we never get sick of here. And uh, we want to thank everybody who's been sending it in. Look at oh, this. Oh, Loyola O'Brien of O'Brien's Boat Tours came in and gave us this wicked footage of a pot of orcas off Whitless Bay. Gorgeous. He says uh, he's been in the boat tour business for 30 years and he's never seen as many whales as he has this year. Oh, just fantastic. Gorgeous. I still haven't had a chance to see them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we went out, uh, my family went out to uh, Cape Spear yesterday oh, and it was bus, just a fantastic day and literally, oh man, that video is so good. Uh, literally, we lost count of how many whales we were seeing. Uh, just from standing on shore at Cape Spear. So it has been a great year, a late year for those capelin coming in, but looks like the whales are dining out now. <laughs> All right, so how's she going, Gage, this week? Yeah, not half bad uh, today. Uh, as we roll into tomorrow, we're cranking things up. Pretty nice day overall. Temps a little bit cool along that coast. We're going to warm things up for Thursday, especially on the island. We'll be into the split in the rock territory. But of course, as we work our way back towards the weekend, uh, kind of back towards the not half bad uh, uh, territory as we talk about uh, the weather in general across the province. Of course, tough for the house she go engage to get every uh, corner of uh, nook and cranny uh, factored in there. But uh, generally speaking, things are going to be turning a little more unsettled towards the weekend. Uh, here's how things are shaping up right now. We've got, again, just 11 degrees in St. John's. Some cooler air certainly along the Atlantic coastline here. That's been thanks to the cloud cover and the rain from this system that is now moving out. Area of high pressure moves in tomorrow. That brings us into the sunshine mix, but also with that northerly flow and the northeasterly flow across St. John's and eastern parts of Newfoundland. That's going to keep temperatures, yeah, closer to 18 degrees. 20 in through Gander towards 24 in Grand Falls, Windsor, and the chance of some afternoon showers, Happy Valley Goose Bay, and across to the Cartwright region. Now, as we look ahead to Wednesday evening into the overnight, high pressure remains in firm control 
but we are watching our next system starting to move in from the west into Labrador. So showers into Labrador City for Thursday afternoon. Happy Valley Goose Bay into a pretty good chance of some of those showers as well. I think the island stays dry Thursday, but certainly clouds thicken up into the afternoon for the west coast of the island. Cornerbrook, things will cloud up there. Uh, looking at Grand Falls, Windsor, Gander, St. John's. Sun and cloud mix 24 to 25, 26 degrees. A very nice day indeed. And again, you can see where the clouds will really be building up there. It's the icons in uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay and those showers in through Labrador City. So this system wanders eastward and I think pretty good chance of showers pretty much from start to finish for you folks along the west coast on Friday, anywhere from Port of Basque up towards the northern peninsula. And then of course back across Labrador where the system will be basically overhead and a bit of a blocking setup here. So that low is just just going to kind of sit and stall. It's building clouds for central and east on Friday, but I think we're dry and you can see where we've got those shower chances. Uh, the best chance certainly over western Newfoundland and through Labrador. So the long range setup, this low kind of sits and spins for Friday into Saturday. It will be almost holding hands with our next system that moves in from the south. These two will kind of merge and the long story short here is this system does have the potential to bring some heavier rains into the region. Now the timing of that is still a little uh, uncertain right now. It looks like the best indication would be a late Saturday in through Sunday morning, maybe some clearing in the west Sunday afternoon, but uh, looking at that uh, late Saturday in through Sunday time period right now. So I don't think the weekend as a whole will be a washout, but we're going to have to nail down the timing of that incoming system and still a little uncertain there certainly and that's kind of been the name of the game this summer hasn't it systems come in on the weekend and not half bad as we uh, take a look and uh, my apologies for those temperatures missing on uh, Monday Tuesday in Lab West but to right around the 20 degree mark there with that seven day trend time now for our athlete of the day and tonight we're introducing you to this young athlete from Bay Bulls this is Kaylee Joyce who's 10 she plays basketball, soccer, and runs track. Kaylee's team won a gold medal in provincial basketball this past year, and she also received ribbons for three events she competed in at Track Fest. Great work, Kaylee. You're today's Young Athlete of the Day. Well, though it may be summer, tis the season for one Winnipeg family. When a relative received a terminal cancer diagnosis, they came together to create Christmas in July. 61-year-old Debbie Peterson was told she may have only three to six months left to live. So her family and friends threw a surprise get-together for her over the weekend. And of course, Santa made an appearance and handed out gifts to nearly 100 guests.
Welcome back to Here and Now. The Assembly of First Nations begins its National General Assembly in Regina today. Twice a year, more than 600 First Nations gather to decide their priorities. The theme for this assembly, Our Children, Our Future. And as Karen Pauls reports, chiefs want to see action, not hear more promises. Beyond the ceremony, the celebration, and the prayers for wisdom and understanding lie some very difficult and long-standing issues, including youth suicide, child welfare, missing and murdered women and girls. Every child has a right to a safe and healthy home and to grow up in a society where they are treated with dignity and respect and have the same opportunities as other children. A handful of federal ministers are at the assembly today talking about how to improve the relationship between Ottawa and First Nations. Canada acknowledges that greater fiscal flexibility and autonomy is necessary for First Nations. First Nations leaders say current fiscal policies make it hard for them to get anything done on reserve, so they're making changes. The first allows them to carry forward funds they haven't been able to spend by fiscal year end, making it easier to start and finish housing projects. The second, changes on how Ottawa funds operation and maintenance costs for on-reserve infrastructure like schools and water and waste treatment. During the 2015 election campaign, Justin Trudeau made 18 major promises to Indigenous people. Two years later, Indigenous leaders are becoming increasingly frustrated and angry over the broken and unfulfilled promises, from pipeline development to self-governance to Indigenous rights. But even then, there are questions about whether those discussions will happen between Ottawa and the AFN or with individual First Nations. We really need to look at that inherent right policy because we're being forced into it as a treaty nation. As a federal government, we are ready to embrace your vision and your views of what a nation-to-nation -nation relationship is. Chiefs here are putting Ottawa on notice. From languages to housing to healthcare, action is what we're talking about. Actions to improve the living conditions and the future of their people. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Regina. A female Canadian swimmer made history today. Kylie Moss's first class race made a big splash at the World Aquatics Championship in Budapest. Kylie Moss, a 21-year-old Canadian, a new world record, 58-10. A tight race from start to finish. Moss is neck and neck with an American and an Australian and then surges ahead for a victorious win. She becomes the first female Canadian swimmer to win a world title. Her time of 58.10 seconds snaps the longest standing record in women's swimming held for the last eight years. The 21-year-old is from LaSalle, Ontario. That's just outside Windsor. Moss recently captured a bronze medal at the 2016 Summer Olympics in Rio. A Montreal man has been charged with first-degree murder in the stabbing of his pregnant partner. The baby she was carrying was delivered yesterday by emergency C-section but later died. The 37-year-old suspect appeared in a Montreal courtroom this afternoon. He faces seven other charges, including the attempted murder of his wife, death threats and car theft. Police arrested the man hours after the pregnant woman was rushed to hospital with multiple stab wounds. The woman survived the attack. Two men have died after being found unconscious in an underground tunnel at a copper mining museum in Murdochville, Quebec. One of the men was an employee in his 50s, the other a volunteer in his 60s. The town says they may have been poisoned by gas from a pump that was being used to clear water out of the tunnel. The museum had only reopened one week ago. It was partially destroyed by a fire in 2012 and then closed because of a $120,000 deficit. Wildfires are sweeping across parts of southern France, including the island of Corsica. These images were captured from the window of a tour bus. Flames can be seen close to the road as cars and buses drive past. Another amateur video shows flames consuming a hillside. Some 1,400 hectares of forest and woodlands have been destroyed in the region, a popular vacation spot. A tossed cigarette butt is thought to have been the cause of the outbreak. 
In India now, at least 12 people have died after a building collapse in Mumbai. Rescue crews have pulled around a dozen people from the rubble so far, but dozens more are feared trapped. Fifteen families and a nursing home occupied the four-story building. The collapse coincides with major renovations. Yes, the Rolling Stones are starting things up once again and heading back to the studio. Keith Richards has revealed the legendary rockers are set to record their first album of original material in more than a decade. And that video is more than a decade old, <laughs> for sure. They've also got a European tour penciled in for the fall, so the band's not exactly taking it easy for their 55th year together. Wow. <laughs> Two young sisters from Ottawa who had their unlicensed lemonade stand shut down last year are back in business. But they say they're selling a whole lot less lemonade this time around. Way more competition this year. <laughs> and is there less uh, people going on, on their bikes or is, is it really because of competition? It's really because of the competition, but sometimes it's because of the weather. <laughs> well, the sisters opened up shop this weekend with special permission from officials. After they made headlines last year, a new program was launched allowing kids to get permits to sell goods on designated roadways. So now the girls are learning yet another valuable business lesson, how to deal with competition. <laughs> <laughs> they don't look happy about it. <laughs> well, here's a situation officials likely never saw arising. A Washington truck driver was hauling waste from a bakery when the summer heat got the better of his cargo. High temperatures were causing the dough to rise. Police were eventually called to take a look at the ooze flowing from the vehicle and highway troopers snapped these images of the expanding mess. <laughs> well, at least it would smell good. Uh, most, it's more you can say for most garbage spills. Uh, have a look at our beautiful viewer picture of the day. Uh, this is a sunset over Old Perlican Island. And Yvonne, thank you so much for sending that in. Gorgeous. Very nice. And that's it for us. Have a great evening. We'll see you tomorrow. Good night. Good night.